Well, hello and welcome, Ray Dalio. Oh, it's good to see you, Colin. Thank you, and it's good to see you again too. Let's start um, with uh, well, let's let's start with one of your favourite subjects. In fact, uh, for some time now, you've been saying that capitalism needs to be reformed, that the U.S. economy is not redistributing opportunity, and that this is causing conflict between the rich and the poor. Now, of course, we've also seen this conflict exacerbated by the COVID-19 crisis, so that it's now as important as ever to be having this conversation. In the US, the income gap is about as high as it ever has been, and the wealth gap is the highest it's ever been. And as part of the American dream, we're being lost to people who are poor, being stuck being poor. The idea that everyone has the same opportunity is not so true anymore economic mobility is stunted in the United States. So for those who haven't read your readings, which I've truly enjoyed reading over these past weeks in preparation today, or seen interviews with you, can you just lay out for us what you see as the main problems in the United States in regards to broken capitalism? Well, I think any system it, you know, has a goal. So let's start with the goal. Are we achieving the goal? And I think um, equal opportunity is um, a goal. Uh, certainly the idea that the system is fair and that you draw on those large a population as possible of talent so that that talent, then you bring the most talented number of people up to top makes a better society. And it's been shown over and over again that when you have a large wealth gap, um, it is. It becomes increasingly unfair, and it becomes a problem about sustainability. So we see a clash now between socialism or of or maybe uh, losing capitalism as we're at each other's throats. And I'm saying that um, uh, when I say it's it's not fair, what I mean is mechanistically. I'm not dealing with this ideologically. What I mean is mechanistically, uh, uh, for example, if somebody earns more money, and it, by the way, that's great. If they earn more money, though, it means that they can spend more on their kids' education and they can perpetuate something that creates a difference in opportunities. And so that when that gets large enough, like it is now, now in the United States, the top 40% of the population spends on average five times as much money on their kids' education as those in the bottom 60%, then that doesn't create a fair system and it doesn't draw on the talents. And so that produces the types of problems that actually make the system risky. So, okay. So, so you talk in your papers uh, about the, uh, need to grow the pie. But here we are in a world of COVID-19 where uh, we've got contraction occurring, it seems, across economies around the world. So is this possible, what you propose, without redistribution of wealth? Well, I, 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 uh, yeah, you ask a few parts of that question. So uh, let, let me just uh, say Capitalism is an, generally an efficient system of allocating resources. It creates incentives. And if the value of what you produce is greater than the cost of that production, you prosper. And so it allocates resources pretty efficiently, but not as effectively as ne needed to achieve those, those goals. And so quite often, capitalism is a means of increasing the size of the pie. For example, in China, when Deng Xiaoping came in and he made the state capitalism, that is what unleashed the Chinese population. And it's a far better system than systems that don't do that. But when it grows, it creates the wealth gap and it creates the opportunity gap and it creates the challenge. It's just mechanistic. And so what I'm saying now is that capitalists tend to know how to increase the pie, but they don't know how to divide the pie well. 
and socialists are more likely to divide it well, but not necessarily um, know how to grow it well. And so in order for a society to be great and live well, it ha it's dependent on its productivity. So you have to both increase the size of the pie, mean in increase productivity, and then divide it well. So that's what I'm saying. And then, of course, we then have the impediments. So you have something like uh, COVID, and of course, that makes it challenging to make production, but it also tends to highlight the differences. You know, like um, people who are financially better off are getting through this just fine. And then I'm involved with uh, some of the situations that are out there, like education of poor people in, in the state of Connecticut, where I am, which is one of the richest states in the United States, uh, 60,000 kids don't have computers and don't have connectivity, so they don't have education. And so when you're dealing with those types of things, these things come to the surface, of course, and that's where we are. So you see it reflected in the politics. You turn on the television. You see it in the, in the presidential um, conventions. And you see it then in the streets. You see it in burning of, you know, and, and fights, that kind of conflict. And so the more you have stress and financial stress, that make greater that polarity exists and the more undermining that is to productivity. So it's not just fair, unfair, it's damaging. So let's talk, in fact, uh, on, on, on COVID-19. Uh, COVID-19 has certainly highlighted which countries have robust safety nets and health systems and also, you know, how they value, uh, how they value essential service workers and indeed the entire populations. Needless to say, the United States has not fared very well or rated very well by any of these measures. In other countries where capitalism reigns, including our country, Australia, where I come from, uh, the United Kingdom, New Zealand, France. This is not, uh, this, uh, sorry, there is not this extreme situation be between the haves and the have-nots. So what is unique about the United States? Is this really about capitalism or is it more layered than that? About some deeper form of philosophy or moral aptitude or the balance between community and individualism? So I guess my question is, you know, capitalism is of course not a form of government, so is the conversation not really about democracy versus socialism, socialism and perhaps even the corruption of government? Um, the, the United States um, is a country um, uh, of immigrants, as uh, Australia is. Um, and then it has allowed itself in various ways to create a greater degree of polarity. So if there are um, parts of the country and inner cities, large parts of the country, where there's no acceptable bottom, there's no minimum level. And so there are um, not only levels of poverty, literally, but there are um, shootings in schools, gangs. Um, I'm in Connecticut, as I say one of the richest states in the country, Hartford, Connecticut, the center of the, um, the capital of the state. Um, my wife works it to try to help these school districts. Children literally have a problem walking to school because of gangs and shootings. And, and, and then there's the, they're, the, the parent issue. They're not the parent raising the issue. And so it's a self-perpetuating problem because if the kids are not raised well, um, then they become, um, they produce problems. In the state of Connecticut, again, one of the richest, 22% of the high school students are disengaged or disconnected. Disengaged means that the attendance in school is less, is, is more, uh, the absentee rate in school is more than 25% and they're failing classes. 
And disconnected means they don't know where they are because they've dropped out of school, 22%. Now, in that, those 22%, they're not going to be in jobs. They're going to be in problems. And so it creates an incarceration problem. So the problems of civility and the problems of poverty uh, are, um, are, are American problems. So you turn on the TV and you see it worse. Guns is a problem. Um, so those are the issues because there's a level be beneath which you can't let children be raised in. You can't have civil behavior. And we've let that happen too much. So, so, so as you speak there, Ray, I, I you know, consider the, uh, the issues, many of them are global, uh, but some of them, as you point out, are, are unique to the United States. And I find it uh, troubling that uh, that's juxt the juxtaposition is uh, the, uh, the sloganism that we have during election campaigns like right now between uh, Trump and Biden, make America, make America great again. We've got these uh, issues of environment. We've got guns, drugs, inequality, racism, access to education and health. Um, just as just to name a few. Uh, where well, and also you have you also have debt and spending and overspending and debt and printing of money. That's part of it too. And as you've already highlighted, massive inequality. Uh, should we be perhaps focusing more on Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments rather than on the wealth of nations? Well, I'm, I, again, I'm just a, uh, a mechanic. Uh, <laughs> and, and the way that I, you, you know, the way that I look at it is, uh, first, I don't want to approach this moralistically. I want to just say, um, what is our national goal? What, what, would, what do you want your society to be like? And how do you engineer for it? Okay, and so yeah, so, so and then mechanistically to understand why that's occurring, because let's say, for example, it, it, what it means is there's a mechanics behind this. I touched on the fact that if you acquire more wealth, you have better circumstances to allow your benefits to go to your kids and so on. And we all want that as parents. And yet at the same time, it creates that. But also, let's say profit. The profit system is not necessarily good enough the way it works. Uh, let's say, for example, education. That profit, e equal education, equal quality education and pervasive quality education in the system, the way it's designed, is not profitable in the same way because of mechanics. So, for example, if I'm in a state that is a richer state, they have more tax revenue because the Constitution of the United States means that the state is responsible for education. And so those in the state that are richer have more and those in, that are in a tax district that are richer have better education. So those kinds of mechanics, uh, or, or let's say, um, if, we, if we take uh, populism, we're emerging with populism. And what is populism? Populism is because a group of people is suffering and feels that it's unfair. Now, let's say globalization, it's good for the world. Global, globalizing is good for the world because you produce it in the most effective place. But you have to realize that that also means that where it raises living standards in places that benefit from it, let's say like China, it takes a job and it moves it from somebody else. So we, what we've seen is within countries, you've seen the wealth gap increase but between countries, you have seen it shrink. So if you're in a country that is, a, a, let's say a wealthier country, and you're at the part of it where it's going down, there's a constituency um, mechanically that then has problems with that and then votes 
to get the, the populist elected. And there's populism of the left or populism of the right. And that's all mechanical, right? So, so the thing I think is most important is um, to design a system that works well, that's bipartisan. In other words, the biggest issue that we face, I think, is being at each other's throats and not finding a system that is gonna work for the majority of people. So, so you can see it in the election. You see the one extreme against the other extreme in a fight that the one side will defeat the other side and then they're going to you know, do it to the other side. So what we need is more of the need of what is the goal and how will we get that in a bipartisan, reasonable way so that you can engineer prosperity and do the things that are right, provide pervasive good education and those types of things. So Ray, that's, uh, that's very clear. Uh, uh, even this week as we speak, we are seeing multiple cities of, uh, in the United States uh, with civil unrest uh, and in fact, multiple cities burning. Um, how, uh, how do you see us finding bipartisanship uh, anytime soon? I think, I think it's unlikely that we will find it other than the hope is that maybe even discussions like this and places realizing that that is our worst fear so that we will lose it all if we keep fighting with each other and that we have to empathize and work together to find something that the majority of people, you're never going to get all people, but that the majority of people think that that's fair. So I, as I say, you have to increase the size of the pie. You have to raise productivity and then divide opportunity, most importantly, but also create enough civility so that the basics are taken care of. You know, I, I grew up, I went to a public school. I went, uh, you know, lower middle class family. My dad was a jazz musician. My mom was a stay at home mom. I was lucky enough to go to a, a public school, parents who cared for me. And if you don't cover some of that basics and you don't create that system, so maybe the fear of the burning, the fear, the, the revulsion of that type of conflict can lead us to that. But there's a money part of this too, you know? We're, um, we need to talk about the money part. This, this, comp this, what I mean by the money part is the United States has, because it has a reserve currency, it's established, 1945, we made it. Uh, we've been able to borrow from the rest of the world more money than we lent. We run deficits to the rest of the world. And we've gotten quite a bit of debt and we print it. And so we're living too much on debt and printing for the rest of the world. And that threatens the reserve currency status of that. Because you think of a bond, a bond, we're investors. And so a bond is a promise to receive currency. And when there's a lot of debt and you, they can print the currency, that's what you see is done. And so we've seen that. And when they print that money, it causes financial asset prices to go down because the value of that money is decreased. So now you look at bonds and you look at debt. That's an interesting part of this mix too. Okay, so, so, so if you, you're- The <laughs> basics of being strong are that you earn more than you spend, you improve your balance sheet and you do that in a fair way in which you're productive, it's fundamental. So we're talking some uh, pretty basic fundamentals here in the sense that uh, we should be spending a lot less and pulling our lifestyles, trimming our lifestyles, it sounds like to me, you're suggesting to uh, the world over. Well, it, one way or another, over a period of time, your income has got to equal or exceed your expenditures. 
And then you have a balance sheet. And that balance sheet can either be assets that get drawn down or they're going to be debts that get built up and that won't last. So that's fundamental. I'm a mechanic, as I say. <laughs> so if you've just tuned in, uh, you're listening to Ray Dalio, the founder of Bridgewater Associates and also the co-chairman and chief investment officer. And we're trying to solve uh, all of the world's problems uh, in, this, uh, in this few minutes. Uh, let me go back to, uh, and remember, Ray, where we want to end up in this conversation is what institutional asset owners are uh, controlling trillions of dollars of other people's money uh, watching us today, what they can do uh, to help move forward some of these issues. But before we get there, it's a destination. Before we get there, let's um, go back for a moment and just, uh, again, from your paper, Productivity and Structural Reform, Why Countries Succeed and Fail. And I think you've, you've alluded to the answer on this, but I just want to read it out to you and, 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 and hear you confirm uh, that you've suggested that poor education, a poor culture, one that impedes people from operating effectively together, poor infrastructure and too much debt cause bad economic results. Now, we see that in many failing countries all over the world, but arguably we see that right now in the United States. Are you saying that the United States is also suffering from a poor culture? Um, uh, yes, if, in, in some ways yes, in some ways no, right? So I gave in that report um, a number of uh, statistics that are also leading indicators for the 10-year growth rates. Um, and by the way, that's available if anybody wants it at um, uh, economicprinciples.com or bridgewater.com. Uh, anyway, um, so what you see is some very good cultural things that are, uh, generally speaking, uh, relatively lower corruption rates that exist in some other countries, rule of law, um, pretty good ability to set up a business effectively. So there are some statistics here um, that are, uh, are, are really excellent statistics. And so then there are a number of important statistics that matter in the form of um, education rates, education statistics, are very good indicators. The, one of the best indicators is the cost of an educated pe person. It's not just whether you have educated people, but are they uh, competitive at that price in world markets? And in that way, the United States' educational decline is a problem. Its level of indebtedness is a problem. And its level of competitiveness in the world is a problem. You also see um, whether it operates cohesively. There are different measures of statistics about conflict. And when you have a lot of internal conflict, it uh, indicates that you're going to have a lower level of productivity. Those are things that are problems. And, they, and, and so you could think of the world order as um, beginning in 1945. You know, what I mean by world order is um, you have a war and then um, you divide up the world and you decide what the rules of the game are. We created a monetary system in 1944, a dollar-based monetary system, and we created a um, world order, U.S. world order in 1945. Then from that point forward, we had a pretty much a clean slate. So now we are in a position where some of those indicators um, are um, concerning. And you can see it in, in the in power measures. You know, if you particularly, um, I, I did uh, um, reports, which I put on in LinkedIn, um, and you could see these statistics across countries. And you could see um, China, for example, increasing a lot, education, military, and these types of things, and substantially improving while the United States is going down in, in that regard. And you'll see it statistically. I'm not trying to paint a picture. I want to just show the numbers. And when you see that, you also understand the geopolitical global landscape a lot, which is very relevant in Australia or around the world. 
So let's move to uh, to uh, the the, uh, the paper you just referenced, your most recent paper, Ray, on uh, post on LinkedIn. I recommend it uh, to anyone watching. Uh, it's uh, posted on the 5th of April 2019. Uh, I read it again last night, and it's uh, it says it's titled "Why and How Capitalism Needs to Be Reformed." Uh, you mentioned uh, in that in in that uh, that leadership at the top is essential to reforming capitalism. So I'm, I'm going to come to a question on that in a moment. But the paragraph I'd like to read out. Uh, um, that I think seems to be the source of this issue. You quote, as shown below, the income gap is about as high as it ever as ever, and the wealth gap is the highest since the late 1990, 1930s. Today, the wealth of the top 1% of the population is more than that of the bottom 90% of the population combined, which is the same sort of wealth gap that existed during 1935 to the 1940 period, a period that brought in an era of great internal and external conflicts for most countries. Those in the top 40% now have, on average, more than 10 times as much wealth as those in the bottom 60%. That is up six times since... 1980. So we have a couple of uh, co connections here I'm, I'm, I'm drawing together. First of all, that fact uh, that I just read out uh, is not part of the public discussion, really. Uh, certainly not um, in, a, in, in, in the political campaign that we're witnessing right now in the United States. Uh, and secondly, what kind of leadership do we actually need, uh, not just in the United States, but politically around the world? What kind of leadership? What do you think the future leader looks like, um, that, and including in, in, in corporations and business, uh, that will have the capacity to perhaps reinvent uh, the system, as you say, so overdue and necessary? Well, I think I could answer the question of uh, either what is likely, which is different from what is needed. Um, uh, what is likely in leadership, I think, is that the polarity uh, worsens. Um, as we change after the election in the United States or elsewhere, um, they'll have to be a dealing with what are, how do you pay the bills? And there'll be financial consequences. They may be tax law changes or there may be other things. And there are, there is a uh, currency issue. So I want to, at some point we'll get into the markets and what that means for the markets. Cause that's something that's near and dear to my heart and probably your audiences are. Um, and so there will be, consequences and that um so i don't think it is likely i think it's difficult under those circumstances for people to be brought together i think there'll be probably more conflict and as i said in that paper um there are three things that are going on now that are unique that didn't go on that the last time they went on was the 1930 to 45 period and that is first the amount of debt and the ineffectiveness of monetary policy when you hit a zero interest rate you have a lot of debt and you have to print a lot of money the last time that happened was 1933 when you hit zero interest rates and you had to print a lot of money and buy financial assets so that is one the effectiveness of monetary policy. You can't stretch that cycle as much. The second are these gaps, the wealth and opportunity gap, the values gap, and the political gap that all go together. And the third is rising China, a rising power, challenging an existing power, which challenges the world order. Those three things didn't happen in our lifetimes before but happened last time, 1930 to 45 period. So I think that those are uh, the main things and that makes for more confrontation. So that's more likely. What's most needed? The opposite. What's most needed is the capacity to go above one's dis disagreements and realize that you have to produce win-win <clears throat> outcomes, not lose-lose outcomes. Um, in all of these cases, uh, we're going to have more conflict. 
What you need is to realize that we have to bring it together and figure out how do we operate together to produce efficiency. So that's the kind of leadership we need. I think it's, you know, hopefully we get it, hopefully we correct, but uh, uh, maybe not. And so, but there are good trends, you know, I don't want to be, I think ESG is a great trend. I think that there is a realization, in a sense, your your conference on sustainability. I think sustainability is the most important word of the 21st century. And I think it's the most important force. And so there are things that are happening um, that are good things at the same time. So I'm going to move directions uh, here in a moment. Uh, Ray and there's lots of material here I'd like to uh, to, to challenge you on and and and, uh, and I'm sure our audience is interested uh, in, uh, in in many topics. But I, I guess the next question I have for you um, is a bit, uh, I'd like to know what the what the markets might do uh, with the election outcome. Um, I'd like a view from you in terms of whether if it's a Trump win, what does that mean for investors and markets? And if it's a Biden win, what does that mean for investors and markets? But I'm I'm just struck by the comments you made just now. And want to ask you a personal question first, and that is, you know, you're 71. Uh, you're you're uh, you came from a um, you've lived the American dream. Uh, you've come from a very ordinary background, and you're now a multi-billionaire and a philanthropist. Have created the the most successful, arguably the most successful alternative fund manager in the world in Bridgewater. Uh, and now, as a multi-billionaire, you've become one of the top 100 most wealthy people on the planet. Extraordinary, extraordinary success. You're uh, about to have, bring another grandchild into the world, or, or your, 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 your child's about to bring a grandchild into the world. But you're talking like uh, you're very composed in the way you're talking about the what's needed and actually what's likely. So I ask you how you feel about what your grandchildren could be living into at this point, unless we get this very urgent recalibration sorted out. Uh, well, I say, as I say, I'm a, I'm a realist. Um, I have to know how it works and interact with it. And I want to teach my children and those beyond. I'm a very practical man, very practical person. And so um, I think the, the curse of every generation is to not realize the things that happened in prior generations. You know, I was born in 1949. The New World Order began in 1945. And it's been a hell of a ride, you know, to be in the uh, peaceful, um, prosperous, bull market, America empire. Wow. I mean, it was a hell of a ride. But unless I knew from a practical point of view how to deal with this and what the arc is, so I'd say for my grandkids or my kids and for others, I want to teach them how to be practical. You know, how do you navigate it? And, you, and that also has to do with investing because I think that so many of our biases of investing have happened in that kind of an environment and yet we learn the lessons of that. So when I think of my kids or my grandkids, the world will be what it is, and just the skills to navigate it well are the most important things, because if you have the skills to navigate it well, you'll be fine. You know, there are risks and opportunities, and so to know how to navigate it, those skills is of paramount importance. Okay, so... Uh... Let me let me ask you next. Then perhaps uh, well, let's 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 deal with the the election and and what markets might do. Can I have a view whether it's a Trump win or a Biden win? What does it matter to investors? What do you what do you think the likely uh, reaction uh, will be by markets? Um, uh, there, it, uh, uh, a Biden win will be a modest. Um, a, a, a modest negative initially, but it won't, uh, in my opinion, be a longer term negative for the following reason. It's, it's all a matter of money and spending. And so what's going to happen is they're going to raise taxes. And so if you take from the get go, they're going to raise taxes and they're going to have more d deficits. So what happens is 
um, just like um, it'll be very similar to Roosevelt, 1933. Okay, so he raised taxes. He raised taxes to the marginal tax rate um, for income was 76%, and he raised those taxes. But at the same time, he raised deficits, and he spent a lot of money. And that depreciated the value of money, but the stock market went up and the bond market went up because the deficits and the printing of money and the fiscal stimulation, it didn't go up in relation to gold prices. It didn't go up in relationship uh, to, let's say, purchasing power of, of that was limited. So what the markets react to, and you've seen it, just recently, uh, um, on April 9th, what you had in the United States was the federal government saying, we are going to give you a lot more money. And you had the Federal Reserve, and then followed by the ECB and Bank of Japan and so on all around the world, we're going to give you a lot more money. And we're going to print that money. And that was very similar to on March 5th, 1933, you had Roosevelt do the same thing. And so as a result, you're having that. You're going to have more of that. So, you, so the initial reaction will be corporate tax rates will rise. Capital gains rates will rise more with the Biden administration. Uh, offshore income will be taxed more and so on. So taxes will go up. And then you're going to have this big fiscal stimulation. So initially, I think the markets probably, you know, markets are, I'm, I'm, who knows? But if you're asking me, you know, to place a, a, a guess, I would say that you would have an initial reaction that would be not good. And then you'd have a more positive reaction as a result of the stimulus but it's really because the value of money is going to go down. And, that what, and that's what makes everything go up. So I'd like to even just touch on that for your viewers to help them understand the, uh, what's going on, really. Um, we look at um, markets through the lens of a currency. And, and, and so we, we judge everything in whether it goes up in that currency, but we sometimes make the mistake of not realizing that those things going up are really because the currency is going down. So when you print a lot of money and you produce a lot more debt, it makes it un an unattractive asset. And so what we've seen is other assets, stocks, gold, and so on, rise as real interest rates have gone down. In other words, inflation-adjusted interest rates have gone down. What, that means the discount rate for all assets has gone down. The Real interest rates go down. It's let they fall in by about a percent. Well, the percent fall times the duration of those assets, like a long duration asset. Stock market has about a 20 or 25 year duration. That means a 1% change has a 25% impact on asset prices and all on. And so you see that kind of appreciation. And so we're in that kind of an environment. And what about a Trump win? What would happen to markets? Well, again, a, a, a Trump win, um, I think probably would produce an initial beneficial reaction and probably longer, a little bit uh, less. The capitalists like capitalists and capitalism. And so, um, you know, the, the, the Trump stimulation, either way, you're going to get a lot of stimulation. So I'd like you to just to, get more of Biden. I'd like to, thank you. I'd like to move to, uh, to uh, impact investing and philanthropy in a, in a moment. Last question on, on, on um, why and how capitalism needs to be reformed. You uh, multiple times refer to the USA's competitors, Ray, uh, as in other countries. And I find that 
interesting from the perspective of if the pie were to grow, does that not mean the pie can grow for all of humanity? Why do we have a competition that sets us up like there's a win-lose situation between nations? Well, both, uh, of course, both go on, you know. There is win-lose situations, and then there's the overall pie for the world. Um, and then if we look at, you know, how it's transpiring, there are certain things that are being produced that are inefficiencies now. We're going to have to change how supply chains work. Protectionism, decoupling. You're going to see decoupling in the world. And, and, that, and those are producing sand in the gears and so on. And then you see between countries, you see different industries. So for example, technology industries, um, if you look at the stock markets, those that have those in the technology sector are the leading countries. So if you look sector by sector, that's particularly benefited the United States and China and then some other kids. So you can increase both, but there's a competition. If you lose the competition, then you obviously um, lose. So both exist. You can increase or decrease the size of the pie, and then you can have that pie. Market share is going to change a lot. And market share is changing a lot, particularly, let's say, in technology, particularly between the United States and uh, China. You know, we're going to have um, Ant Group is going to be um, uh, latest um, uh, upcoming IPO, the biggest IPO of all time, probably about $200 billion IPO kind of uh, valuation, um, China. So you're seeing the capital markets um, and technology moving that way. And so both matter. Yeah, I, I guess um, just a, as a statement, I've just finished reading Mary Trump's book and I, I find it uh, incredible that uh, the current president has a, uh, there must always be a loser. Everything's about a transaction, everything's about winning and there'll always be a loser on the other side. I'm, I'm not sure how that plays out um, in terms of I think uh, international affairs. I, 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 yeah, I think, I think that there's a mentality which is um, a lose-lose mentality. And I think we have too much of this lose-lose rather than win-win. Uh, I mean, it's just a practical thing. Like, um, what? let's say with China, give us the 10 things you want most. Here are 10 things I want most. How do I do a trade so that we move ahead? Because the lose-lose, whether it's an international trade or whether it's the wealth gap within the country, that lose-lose is going to shrink the pie. And so when we talk about productivity and the shrinking of the pie, that is the greatest risk. So we're going to, uh, to move now to, uh, to uh, a new area. In the United States, there are many successful and generous people like you, Ray, that give away a great deal and do a lot for society. But there is this tension between private capital and the role of government. And arguably right now, there needs to be systemic reform uh, and, and that means involving the government more. A closer unity, perhaps, between public and private spending. And again, you've written about this extensively. So what would this look like? I mean, from a government point of view, we have two things on the table here. The closer working of fiscal and monetary policy, known as MP3, which you said last June would be needed when the next big market downturn comes, and taxes. Let's talk specifics here. What government policy reforms need to take place to create this systemic change? Well, I, I, I think that there are a number of areas where you can get a high return on investment from doing double bottom line type of investing. Um, I, as you, you point out, you know, I do a lot of uh, philanthropic stuff and what i the, my favorite stuff is that which is going to have um a double bottom line and what i mean by a double bottom line um is um that it can be sustaining Le i like for example microfinance for every dollar i give to microfinance over the next 10 years it gives 12 dollars in loans and it just keeps going round and around and so on 
if you look at some things like education, people look too much in, in budget, but they don't look in terms of return on investment. We, my family, um, has found ways, very cost-effective ways, of getting kids through high school who wouldn't have been through high school and into jobs. And that's very, the return on that investment is multiples in terms of saving the society from crime or incarceration rates. The incarceration costs range between uh, $65,000 and $120,000 a year for incarcerating a person. So if you, and I see it happen all the time. So the thing that I would start with, if you could, is what are those high return on investments? Infrastructure. So let, let me give another example. Connectivity um, today, the fact that a lot of households, particularly, let's say, poor households, don't have uh, broadband, don't have Wi-Fi, don't, don't have connectivity, or don't have laptops because they're too poor, that's not, that's not having adequate infrastructure. So if you look at what it means, it's like not having water and not having electricity 50 years ago. So those kinds of investments, you know, when they first put in railroads to connect areas and so on, that infrastructure investment is, has a double bottom line, okay, it improves. So there are many, many things that you could start there. Then the other part of it is you have to, I think, establish the fact that uh, there's a bottom and that you have to uh, deal with the bottom. So there's a great cost that is an economic cost and a cost to effectiveness if you don't do those things. So I, I, that's what has to be done, I think, is to look at those return on investment because you can't just spend money without also looking at the returns that that's going to produce because you'll have to borrow money and, and debase the currency and it won't last. So, Ray, you, yourself and your wife have very generously donated over $1 billion already through uh, Dalio, uh, the foundation. Uh, much of what you're talking about in terms of, of uh, the, the um, double bottom line uh, ideas uh, has morphed into impact investing. Uh, and impact investing is almost becoming mainstream as an investment uh, asset class, if you will, or a style of investing. Um, you're still putting that in the philanthropic bucket rather than the investment uh, business. Uh, where do you see the, uh, the two uh, going forward? Well, uh, they're, uh, they're very, very, uh, they're very close, you know, like, so naturally, because I think of return on investment, um, I give attention to what is that return on investment, then can you measure it financially? Because the big thing when I started involved in philanthropy is in the old world, I know whether it would succeed or fail because if it, if it used more resources than it produced in benefits, it would die. But in the philanthropic world, when you don't have that re return on investments, it's a problem. So what we're seeing now is I have three standards for investments. The first is if we make an investment, will it pay back a return? Do I get a real double bottom line? Because then I realize the, my money being donated will go round and around like that. The second is that it is, it's sustainable. Sustainable investing so that it doesn't disappear. That's your conference. Sustainable investing. And that investing is in double bottom line. So if I take that and I do a, you know, like a microfinance or something like that, and it pays, or education, and it pays, that's great. And then the third category is you give it away, and it, because not everything pays, uh, but the challenge of that is um, it, that, that uh, the money will disappear, and it won't last. Uh, Mohammed Yunus um, and got the Nobel Peace Prize for microfinance and sustainable investing. He began impact investing because of that. So impact investing is great 
but you but you have to do the calculations right because also there's a lot of stuff that goes on out there under the name of impact investing that you're doing some social good and it produces a profit and I'm not so sure of that. So it's part of our evolutionary process that we're under, which is a good process because it will mean in philanthropy will be more sustainable because of impact investing. So we must uh, unfortunately wrap up uh, in a maximum of nine minutes from now, Ray. Uh, and it's uh, great news that we have uh, at this global sustainability conference uh, that we're, we're initially uh, recording this session for uh, as part of top1000funds.com and the Fiduciary Investor Symposium Series. We have uh, your global head of research, Karen, speaking tomorrow and announcing some very exciting news in terms of what Bridgewater is doing uh, in the area of sustainability. But we'll leave that surprise for our audience for tomorrow. Um, I'm keen to, um, uh, to ask one more question uh, for our institutional investors. What can they learn uh, in regards to measurement in impact investing, which seems to be, you've just touched on it now, but it seems to be a constant struggle uh, in terms of the impact space. What have you learned so far that institutional investors can learn from in terms of measurement of impact investing? Well, that, it, um, that impact investing is easier to measure in some ways than philanthropy because there is an element of profitability in, in, or, or a return on investment in, in one form or another that you can keep an eye on. So that second bottom line tells you something about the resource, but that it is still very difficult. In philanthropy, it's, it's a challenge. How do I know if I give a sum of money that there's that return? So impact investing will be more difficult to um, measure than regular businesses' profitability, but it's, uh, it's still difficult. So we're in that evolutionary phase. Quick answer, if you can, uh, Ray, important subject, but a quick answer, if you can, just because we're running to time. Uh, I'm really fascinated by how oceans made it almost to the top of your list as an area of philanthropy. Why? Oceans are the greatest asset of the country, it, the world. It's the biggest asset that exists. 72% of the world's surface is the ocean. Um, that means, and, and the highest part of land, Mount Everest, is equal to the greatest depth of the ocean. So it's almost symmetrical, the, the Marianas Trench. And so the area underneath the ocean is about twice the size of all the land in the world and so on. It's undiscovered, it's an important natural resource, and it's thrilling. So we have... Uh, done a lot. We, we, I'm excited that we have created um, the the best oceanographic research and media ship that supports scientists there. And not only they're going to be shown in their work, but they're uh, at, at, they're going to take you under the sea and they're going to blow your mind. If you want to go <laughs> see aliens, you don't go to outer space. You're going to go under the sea. And you're going to see these aliens and so on. So we're going to do this Jacques Cousteau type of exposure to that kind of exploration so that people are thrilled because the, the food we get, the atmosphere we have, all of that comes from that ocean. So it's the most important asset, the biggest asset, and it's also one of the most exciting unexplored places. So that's why I'm excited about it. Yeah, good man. Well, uh, as, as someone who's been, uh, done 150 deep sea dives, I totally agree with you. It's, it's uh, absolutely wonderful and wild, right? It's so much fun. Beautiful. It is. really is. Last question for you, my friend. Uh, we are now year one since the uh, Business Roundtable statement uh, was put out, redefining the purpose of a corporation uh, and a movement towards stakeholder capitalism. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about stakeholder capitalism in that time. We've also seen neat initiatives like Just Capital launched by Paul Tudor Jones and holding corporates to account in a transparent way, and then initiatives like Alphabet issuing green bonds. What more do you think corporate America or corporates all around the world 
in fact, need to do to help solve these issues? Well, uh, uh, that's a great list. And if, and, and if there's following those th uh, things through, I'm, you know, I'm particularly excited about ESG. Ooh, I think that's a big deal. You know, like two thirds of investors are gonna be in it. Now, how you define it and you operationally, Karen will deal with that tomorrow. Um, but, but, but that's right. People are realizing, and it's no longer cool to be not doing the right things. And so, yes, I'm, I'm, uh, it, you've given the list and that's the new, that's the new list. Now let's make it rea uh, a reality and let's make it profitable too. Let's make it pay. Let's make that because you can because your conference of sustainability, that's where the rewards are. Sustainable investing and sustainable planet, they all go together and we're beginning to get that aligned. And so though, yeah, I guess just follow through with those things, there's plenty on the plate. Well, congratulations to, uh, to you and your team at Bridgewater for moving down this path on sustainability and ESG. Uh, and as said, uh, we look forward to hearing the specifics from Karen tomorrow. Uh, congratulations also on your recent membership of the Principles of Responsible Investment. And I hope that this is just the beginning for all alternative managers and hedge funds all around the world uh, to get on board. Before we wrap up, I'd like to, um, uh, first of all, give um, uh, a plug to your most recent book, Principles by, by Ray Dalio. Um, as I'm holding it there, I, um, I love the quote from Bill Gates uh, on the cover, Ray. Ray Dalio has provided me with invaluable guidance and insights that are now available to you in principles. A couple of personal closing questions. What are you most proud of, Ray? Well, um, I, I, my, my personal objective is to evolve well and contribute to evolution and to pass along more than I came with. And so I guess I, uh, I'm most proud of um, my doing that. And uh, you have another grandchild arriving uh, imminently. Uh, and I imagine that's the best. That's the best? I bet that's it is what I'm most proud of. Um, um, but um, if you ask me what I'm most pleased about, Oh, it's a phase of life when you've got grandkids. I, I promise you, as soon as you get grandkids, anybody who's got to knows that it's the best blessing of life. It's, it's wonderful. Well, excellent. So well, thank good, you. Well, good, good luck with uh, the arrival of that next grandchild and enjoy uh, these, these coming weeks. Uh, and uh, congratulations also uh, personally uh, on, on signing the pledge with uh, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett to give your fortune away and leave the world in a better place. I've really enjoyed our chat today. Uh, it's, a, it's a real honour. So thank you so much, Ray Dalio. Thank you so much for having me and, and thank you for doing a sustainability conference. It's a pleasure. See you next time. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.